our Google trainers. Some of you might have sat in on the training that she did um, with Google, Google Fundamentals 4, and last year she also did some training for us. So I'm sure she's someone you'll be hearing a lot more of in future. Just for um, some one or two things we need to keep in mind, um, I have not activated the ability for you to unmute yourself. So if you want to say, ask something, please raise your hand. I see there is one person who's raised their hand. I'm just going to lower it for now because we'll get to questions a bit later. So raise your hand. But before you even do that, use the chat. Andrea is going to try and answer the questions as far as possible. I'm also going to try and keep an eye on the chat to um, see what questions might arise. Um, and yes, from that, we're going to dive into what you can do with Google Forms. So first and foremost, with Google Forms, what we're going to do is we're going to try and split the session into two parts. The first part will focus on the, um, the survey element of Google Forms. So in other words, how do we use it as a survey tool? And then secondly, and I'm sure this is the part that a lot of you are interested in, how do we use it as a quiz tool? Right, so let's just quickly run through what we have on the agenda today. And you'll see there's quite a lot of things that we want to cover. So um, two hours is, in a sense, not really enough to get to everything with Google Forms. So we are not going to necessarily rush through things. There's a lot more to Google Forms than what we'll be looking at today. Um, but we're going to try and make sure that the basics are in place and that you understand exactly how to use this with the intention that as of tomorrow, you can start building your first Google form. So the first thing we're going to look at, obviously we can't do anything if we can't create them. So we need to we need to know how to create and how to access our Google forms again. So that's step number one. Step number two, we're going to look at all the different question types that are available because there's quite a variety of things you can do in Google forms. And we're also going to talk about one or two best practice things that, that you need to keep in mind when setting up a quiz, when setting up a survey, things like that. The next thing we want to look at is just how do we add some media interactivity to our um, to our forms? So how do we add images? How do we add videos? What can we do with these things? Um, the next part we want to look at, and this is a part that many people actually aren't using in their forms, but it, it's quite a useful thing is a how do we add different sections to a Google form? And then lastly, of course, you need to be able to share the form. How do you get this form to whoever needs to complete it? Um, because that's obviously a vital part of using the form. So that's going to be the first hour that we want to tackle, um, focusing on Google Forms. This part of it is going to be dealing a lot more with the survey aspect of Google Forms. So the second, oh, of course, sorry, and the last thing we need to look at is how do we actually access the responses? Because it doesn't help we send out a form and we don't know how to see what people, how people reply to the form. Then the next part we want to look at, part two, is now how do we change the form to a quiz? And this is actually a question that, that I've had quite a lot. People say that they've heard a lot about Google Quiz. Where, where do we get it? What is Google Quiz? Now, Google Quiz doesn't actually exist. There's nothing like Google Quiz. But what Google Forms did after a lot of teachers um, did a lot of hard work and a lot, through a lot of creative, uh, a very creative approach to using Google Forms, Google have added the quiz functionality to it. Now, all that the quiz really does is it adds the option to say whether or not an answer is correct or incorrect. So that's a big difference between a, a form and a quiz. And then there's a couple of other little things about it that you need to keep in mind. Um, the next, then we want to look at how the mark allocations, answer keys, and feedback function functions of the quiz work. We also want to look at how do you actually access the responses. Um, same as with with the the other form, just there's a slight stag here. Then there's a key thing that we I think often overlook with Google um, with with when we look at the Google quiz option. Um, yes, you can have set up a little tool that automatically marks things for you. But there's a manual review function there in there that's actually quite useful to use as well. And we're going to look at that as well. And then how do you link this to a Google Sheet? Now, the same is going to apply both ways. This is the last step that we need to look at. How do we link to a Google Sheet? And if there's some time, I'm going to show you some cool extra tricks that you can, that you can use um, when we're going to apply and implement some of these things. 
Right, so with that said, before we dive into a Google form, I think there's one of the best ways to really get a sense of what a Google form really is, is to go and complete a Google form. So what I want you to do now is I'm going to paste a link in the chat, open up that link and complete the form. It's not going to take you very long, um, but what I want to show you on my side is actually why we want to use Google Forms and how it becomes useful. Right, so you'll see on my side, I've actually got the responses open here. So as soon as people are, have started filling in the responses, immediately it's going to start popping up here. So let's have a look at your... Hi, Yaku. Hi. Just a, just a quick, yeah, I've opened it, but apparently you need permission, so maybe your sharing rights aren't completely open. Just have a look at that, please. Yes. Sorry, Thank um, you. I didn't open it. Thank you very much, Andrew. Right, so just refresh that page and now it's going to work. See, it's important to note, to note that even if you know it very well, it's always good to test your things. And I'm going to show you a little trick how we can actually test our forms effectively because you'll be this has happened very often. It's an anonymous form, so don't worry about having to add your name here. All right, and you'll see, if you look at my screen, now you need to go back to the session, please don't stay in that Google form, otherwise you'll stay in there forever. Um, but if you go back to my screen, you, you would have noticed that the feed is coming in live. As people are responding to it, I'm getting the information. Now, in, te in, in terms of a survey, what's great about this is I can start figuring out the type of, or I can start looking at this information and start making decisions based on this information. So the first thing I want to have a look at is, how would you rate your knowledge of G Suite? And I'm quite happy to see that there's quite a lot of us that are quite comfortable with G Suite. Remember, Google Forms is one of the many things inside the, the bigger Google environment that you can use. So having a good understanding and underpinning of the rest of it helps a lot. So I see the one person who rated themselves five is a very arrogant um, e-learning advisor who decided I'm going to rate myself as a five. But I see there's quite a lot of us that say we know G Suite quite well. And how would you rate your knowledge of Google Forms? There's quite a lot of us who have used it, so that's also good to see. I hope we're going to show you a couple of extra tricks here. And then, which of the following Google Fundamental sessions did you attend? I'm very glad to see this. So it's it's great to see that most of you that are here, it's a continuation of the Google learning process, um, which is wonderful to see. So so we're building on a foundation already. So as a teacher, and as a as a trainer in this instance. This is great for me because I can look at this and I understand there are certain things that I can, to an extent, assume, maybe incorrectly, but there's some baseline knowledge to work with. I can already go at a different pace just based on this on this part already, which is which is very good to see. Um, so I'm glad that we can establish establish that. Right. So let's start from the very beginning. How do we create a Google form? Now, with all of the Google tools, there are two ways in which to do this. The one way is we click on the waffle over here. Once we've logged in, of course, we click on the waffle and then you'll see forms will be one of the options there. So if you click on that, it'll take you straight to this to this landing page for Google Forms. And now you can create a Google form. But those of you who would have attended our, um, our sessions on um, on Google Fundamentals, I think especially at, in Fundamentals three and four, this is, a, is an idea we really try and, and, and establish with you. It's better to go via your drive because otherwise you will end up with a million forms just in your drive and you won't know where to find it. So I like to go Google Drive and then we're going to find a, a, loco a location. So I'm, I've got this training folder that I tend to just dump a lot of things in and then eventually end up deleting them again. 
So in here, I'm happy. This is where I want to create my form. So typically, if you've got a folder where you've got a lot of your work, you can split it according to classes. However, you manage your files. Managing your files is so important because if you're not going to do it, you will never find your Google Forms again. So we're going to right click and you'll see there's all the different Google, um, the Google applications, doc sheets, slides, which you some of you have already attended. We're going to go to Google Forms. And if I click on that, it takes me to the exact same well, not exactly the same place, but it opens up a Google form for me so I can get going with my Google form. Right, so once we're in here, now we can start with our Google form. This is the basic part of the Google form. Here at the top, this is the, the file name, so we can call this whatever we want. Let's call this example form. And over here, we're going to just see that name just automatically copies. It works both ways. So if you call it example form here or example form there, it copies both ways. Something that I found that's that's quite useful. If it's a form that you're not going to complete, you want to revisit it. It's quite nice to kind of star it. If you remember the, the sessions in, in Google Fundamentals 2, when we looked at Google Drive, it's easier to find starred files, for example. So it's nice to star it while you're working with it and then just to unstar it when you're done. Right, so there we've got a form set up. Now, under the name, the title example form, there's the slot where we can add a form description. If you want to, you can add it. If you don't want to, you don't need to add it. So we're just going to say this is just an uh, just an example form. And that's it. So there's my start of my form. Now at this point, if you want to and you don't like the bland purple form, which is the default, what's going to happen, you can just change the look of your form a little bit in order to change the look of your form. Over here where you see the little, um, when you call it the paint, that thing, the paint um, palette. So we can click on that and it opens up the theme options where I can change my Google form a little bit. Please note, you can change it a little bit. It's one of the things that sometimes people get a little bit frustrated because you're very limited in, in the appearance of your, of your form. But over here, you can change it um, to whatever you want. So here you get to choose an image. Um, when you choose an image, you can upload something. They've got a couple of pre-made themes. You can upload something. Um, something that's quite useful, a, a little trick that I can show that I can um, tell you about, but I'm not going to show you how to do it, go and explore on your own, is it has the option for photos. So what I'd sometimes do is some of the things that I use a lot, um, I'll just load it to my photo. So you just go to photos.google.com and you can just upload a couple of banner things there that you some might want to use. This is especially useful on a school account. I wouldn't do it on my personal account because there's a million other photos there that I don't want in here. But um, let's just take this one as an example. I'm going to insert it. Um, this one is one that I already edited to be the correct size. And now we've got a header for our form. What Google will, will do is it'll evaluate this image and it'll try and pick up the colors that are being used. So I can now choose the different colors that I want to use. So I want to make, let's um, use a kind of bluish look for it. You can also, if you don't like that and you want to go a little bit crazy, you can obviously add any kind of color that you want, um, if, even if it's not related to the header image at all. But we're going to go to something that's a little bit more pleasant on the eye. Right, so there's my form. Now I've got the look of my form right. Um, what two other things or one other thing that I can show you, you can also change the font if you want to. Generally speaking, I well not generally speaking, I have never used another font than the basic one. They've got basic, decorative, formal and playful. Playful I think is quite nice for um, for forms that are linked to the to or that are going to be completed by your primary school learners, foundation phase learners, etc. They they will probably like it a little bit. Nice. It's a bit more pleasing on the eye for them. But for what I always use it, I just use the basic. I find formal and decorative sometimes not so easy to read. So I just keep to basic. I'm happy with that. So now we've got the look of our form set up. Let's have a look at the different types of questions we can add. So when you open up a form by default, it'll give you one question. So there's one question that's already been added. Um, and now this one is a multiple choice question. At the moment, it's called untitled question and there's only one option. That option is called option one. 
If you want to change the type of question, you'll see over here, you've got a drop down menu here from multiple choice. So let's click on that quickly and let me explain the different question types that you have. The first one is short answer. And this is typically if you want them to answer in one or two or three words. If you just want a very short answer, for example, let's use this one now. We're going to take a short answer and we're just going to make the first one name. There we go. There it is. Now, with every question that we've added, we have additional features available. So you can either make a required question by clicking on the, that button. So that's going to change it into being a required question. And then when you click on the um, the options here, and every question has this kind of, well, most of them have this kind of functionality. There's two, two options that we've got here, description. What description does is it gives you an extra little line that you can have in there. So here I can say, please enter your full name, excluding your surname, which is not technically a full name, I understand that, but there we go. And now we can also select the option for response validation. Now what response validation is, or does, is response validation forces someone to enter it into a certain or to enter a certain kind of value. So if I select response validation, you'll see this is useful if you want to, for example, make sure that they send you a phone number and not type out something weird that you don't want there. Or you want to make sure that they send you an email address that's actually a valid email address because this is a, often some, an, an issue. So you'll see here when I've opened up the response validation, I've got the, these two settings. For the first setting says what type of value is this going to be? Number, text, length, regular expression. Don't worry about the regular expression because that gets very complicated. Number, text, or length is quite useful because if you don't want long answers, you limit them. Length. If you ask them, please answer your experience or given a, what was your experience in one word, you're going to limit the length and you're not going to allow them to write a long paragraph there. Um, text is quite, or number of course is quite useful because now we're going to have a number that they need to enter and we've got a greater than, it, all these various things you can, you can choose. So they have to enter something. So you can be specific about the information that you want to get from the person. This is especially useful when it comes to surveys, not so much the quiz, but remember we're focused on the survey for now. All right, um, and then you can enter all sorts of details there. So let's say the first thing we want is we want text um, and we want it to. It shouldn't contain a space, please. Oh, actually, it should contain a space. We don't want it to contain a comma. So now I can make sure they can't enter text with a comma in it. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Just as an example, right? So we're happy. First question done. Let's say plus. Now we're going to add another question. So please note. When you're moving around in your form and you want to add a question, let's say this is now our first question, but we don't actually want, if we're going to click plus here, it's going to add a question to the bottom. Um, so let's do that quickly. Now we've got plus, and now we're going to give them the option, and I'm going to show you quickly the auto um, functions that, that Google has for us. If I just type surname, it automatically detects, well, that can't be a multiple choice. It must be a short answer. And there we go, short answer text. Now I'm not going to add all the other little details there to this one, but again, it is an option to add these things. Right now we're going to add another question. And this time we're going to say, we're going to ask them, um, let's say we'll ask gender, for example. Now again, what Google does quite cleverly is it's, it, it picks up options. So we're going to we can have all these options. If you want to just limit them to male and female, you can do that or you can add an other option. Now, let, let me quickly explain how the other option works. If we've got an other option, what happens here is if they select other, it gives them the opportunity to type something else. It, you can go and do this. We add another option by clicking other. But the problem is if we do that, they're going to click on other, but they won't have the option to actually say what they mean by other, if that makes sense. So make sure you understand the difference here, right? We're going to remove that and we're going to say add other. So now I've got three options, male, female and other. 
if they want to type something else in there. Right, so now we've got our basic information there already. Let me pause here quickly and show you another very, very popular mistake that people make. And this is the check boxes versus multiple choice boxes. Because we tend to think, okay, check box means I tick, that's the answer that I want to select. The problem with a check box is a check box allows you to select multiple options. So if um, if I refer to to the 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 form that we um, the, the 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 form that you had to fill in, there were multiple choice options in there, but there were also check boxes in there, which act very differently. So be very careful. This is a very typical mistake that people make, especially when we get to quiz, because if they need to fill in this, there can't be a male and a female and something else simultaneously. It's one or the other. So radial boxes, the radial box, the circle, you can only select one, check boxes, you can select multiple options. Right, so we're going to just go back there. Um, and now we've now we've already captured the basic information that we want here. So let's take a look at another type of question, and that is the drop down menu. So if you've got a long list of things, right? So let's say we, we need to um, collect something, a very, very lengthy um, list of information. Let me just quickly grab a long list of information um, and then we're going to copy it in. So I'm just going to go to our pre-registration um, our pre-registration form and just go copy the school, the different schools that we've got in there, right? Um, and I want to show you how we can do that as well. And just remember everything that we do with capturing this information, all of it we do through Google, um, through Google Forms. So it becomes quite important to, to understand how you are going to deal with, with um, information, how you're going to collect information, etc. So just to show um, this to you quickly, I just want to get to a point where we're not sharing sensitive information. Right, so I just want to show you how we can do this. So you'll see here's a, a, a Google Sheet that we have of the different schools that people registered from for this session. So what I can do is I can select all of these schools. Now that is 86 different fields that I've selected. Select them, right click, copy, and then we go back to our form. And here at the first one, we right click and we just paste. And you'll see now I've got 84 options. Can you see the usefulness in this? And we're going to get back to this when we get to the um, when we we start looking at um, our, our, our quizzes, for example, that we're going to set up. So then we've got a whole variety of options. It's all listed over there, right? And we're going to say school as an example. What I want to show you now, the next the next important thing is as you are building your form, it's a good idea to kind of refer back to it. What does this thing look like while I'm building it? Because this what you see here is not what the form is going to look like in the end. So the next button that I that you need to be very mindful of is the preview button. So you're right at the top. Remember over there we had the customize button next to it. We've got the preview button, the little eye that you click on. Now, if I click on the preview, what it does is it opens up the form the way that it's going to look when you send it to someone. So you'll see here I've got my name, I've got my surname, I've got my gender, and you'll see if I click other, I can type something else if I want to. I've got male or female or other, and school, I've got a long drop down list. Now, what I want to, what I want to take you back to the form because another classic mistake that people make, let's go, let's actually break this one a little bit. So we're going to change this into checkboxes and I'll show you why we don't want to do that. And we take these long lists and we actually don't make them drop downs, but we make them multiple choice. Now let's see why that's not a good idea. I'm going to click on the preview. Right, so here's my example form. Everything looks fine, but now I get to the gender. Suddenly I'm allowed to select all of this. 
which makes no sense. And when it comes to school, now I need to find the school that I, where on earth is the school that I'm looking for, right? So now suddenly I can't find my school because I'm doing it this way around. Whereas if we made sure that we actually use a drop down, and I hope you can see how quick and easy it is to switch between the question types that we're using. And we just go back to the multiple choice. Now, if I have my form and I preview it, when I get to the school, what's especially useful is I can start typing something. Um, no, it doesn't want to work. Right. Um, it's again, it's more useful to make it alphabetical. This is not an alphabetical list, but you can usually you can start typing something and it'll immediately find that for you. Or again, alphabetical is, is generally speaking the best the best course of action. Right. So this is a lot easier to deal with than having all those things in the radial option. So just be mindful of those small mistakes that that we make when setting up a form. Right. So <clears throat> it's obviously it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a, a frustration when you're setting it up when you've got these long lists because you do have to scroll to um, you do actually have to scroll to the point where you're going to get to the end of it. But what I also want to show you now what's useful is moving things around. So if we want to move questions, you'll see when we select things, there's always these little blocks that appear. Can you see there's a block next to Weber Gedenk? So if I realize, oh, this is a mistake, we want to move this one, we're going to move it right to the bottom because alphabetically W should be at the end. We're going to move it right there to the very end. And sometimes it, the, the, when we move things around in this way, it, it often does strange things if it's such a long list, um, especially when we need to start scrolling. It doesn't always pick up where I want to place it. Um, so you'll see names are starting to move around, so I can move it some back over there. Usually in these long lists, just a, a, a general suggestion, make sure that you've got your information sorted beforehand. So if I were, for example, to go up to this pre-register and I wanted to copy this list into, into the thing, I would rather go and make sure that it is sorted alphabetically and then copy it in, if that makes sense. So sort your information, then get it loaded in. But anyway, that's another um, thing we, we can look at. So. Just to discuss one or two other question types, and um, when we get to the quiz, there's one other very useful one that I want to look at specifically, and you're going to see it's interesting one to be able to use, especially in a quiz setting. In a survey, I'll be, I haven't used it yet, um, so then we'll, might, maybe you run into useful ways of using it in a survey as well, um, but it requires a little bit of creativity to deal with it, especially in a survey. So. Or other options that we have that we haven't looked at yet. Um, the file upload, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I have made a short video that I will make available to share with you just to explain what the file upload works like because it takes a little bit longer to explain. Um, one or two other things we can look at the linear scale. So here I can just say rate the quality of your training. And we can say um, poor and excellent. So you filled in a linear question when I um, when you had to fill in that first survey, there was a linear question in there. There was a multiple choice question in there. There was a tick box question in there. So there's a couple of different options that I used in that one already. Um, the ones that are a little bit more complicated are the multiple choice grid and the checkbox grid. We're going to come back to them when we look at the quiz and how to set up a quiz. Right, the last two you could look at, I think they're very self-explanatory, date and time. So just identify date so we can add a date. So here they need to just say, um, let's say birthday, your um, birth date. And then they have a question where they can click on a calendar and can navigate to the thing. Same story when it comes to time, we can actually ask them to enter a time value. Um, what time were you born? Remember that, but there we go. So these, this is a date question and that is a time question. Um, which which is again useful in terms of a survey because we know we're going to get the information 
in a specific way. So especially if you start having to use that information at a later stage in a, in a sheet, for example, you want them to have to enter an actual date and not to type out the date 7 September, because once you allow people to type things, no one can spell. You're going to get 10 people that spell September in 10 different ways, and the system is not going to know what you're talking about. So very important to keep that in mind. Um, when, we, when we've gone through all the question types and different things, I'm going to just talk about one or two very important things in terms of best practice that you need to keep in mind when designing surveys specifically. So now that we've added all of these different question types, so that we've gone through the question types um, that we've got available. Now we maybe we want to start looking at adding something else to this. So what are these other options that we've got on this side? The top one, the plus we know is the adding question. Over there is the import questions option. Um, we're not going to go into that one into too much detail now, but essentially what that allows me to do is to open up other Google Forms that I have access to. Either, other, it can be other forms that I created or forms that I'm a collaborator on, and then I can just pull in questions. You can pull in all of the questions from that form or one or two questions from that form, depending on how you how you want to use it. So it's, it's a very useful way of, of making copies of parts of forms, especially. It's a very useful little trick because maybe you want to have your Google form and multiple classes are supposed to use different forms, but you don't want all the same questions or you designed a form last year, you want to use some of the questions, but not all of them. Very cool trick to be able to import questions. The next one under that, um, I think this is a well-known universal sign for adding text. So if I click on that, it just simply gives me a part to add text. So you can add a, a different title. So if we want to, um, there's various ways in which you can use this. If you just want text somewhere in your thing and you don't want it to be um, a question that they need to answer, you need to um, make some sort of um, announcement. So, so let's say we're going to say disclaimer, the information in this form will not be distributed to anyone, etc. Right. So now we're just going to use. Now we just have some text that's going to appear in there. The next options that we have is the add images option. Right. So now we can add an image. If we click on the add image, it opens up this default insert image thing that, that Google uses. So there's a whole bunch of options that you can use to insert an image. We can upload something. You can activate your camera. Um, oh, there my webcam is working again. So there I can activate my camera. I can go by URL. I can use a, I can insert photos that I already have. I can go into Google Drive. Or sometimes, by far and away, the fastest is just to use Google Image Search to insert an image. So let's just say we're going to ins we're going to look for Google Forms. We're going to look for a Google Form image, and we're just going to paste this image that we want. So you can select whichever image you want to use. So let's say we're going to select that image, and we're going to say Insert, and there we go, a giant image of Google Forms. And we're going to say Google Forms logo. Now, once you've inserted a, an image, again, something that you have to be mindful of because we're going to find it all over the, the various Google tools is the three dots. Now, on an aside note, the three dots is essentially like, like right clicking because if you right click in different places in Google Chrome, it doesn't actually have anything. If you look at these options, it has nothing to do with the page itself. It has to do with Google Chrome. So it doesn't give us options here. So the three little dots is kind of like right clicking on something. So if I click on those three dots, you see I get the options of what I can do here. I can left align it, center align it, right align it, or I can change the image, or I can just remove it if I want to. Those are my options. Again, we're somewhat limited in what we're allowed to do. Um, we can also resize it. If you click on the image, you'll see the block forms around it. And then I can just change it because that's a little bit too big for me. Deselect it again, and then the three dots appear. Three dots and center line, and there we go. There we've got our Google Form image. 
Just note, if you click on it, the three dots won't appear. If you don't click on it, the block, um, the block won't appear. So you can resize it, and then you can change, shift it, center align, left align, right align. However you want to use it, right? The video works very much the same way. If, I got, if I'm going to click on add video, the difference is the video doesn't give you the upload option. You can do it in two ways. You can either search YouTube and you're going to find a video or you can go to or you can paste a URL that you've got already. So um, what I want to just show you very quickly, if we go onto YouTube, um, I'm just going to go to this channel quickly and, and go grab a video from here. Right, those of you who have not managed to wander over to our YouTube channel, there's a ton of very useful videos on here. So please go 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 to our site and go see if you can um, see if you can uh, find some of the videos. Have a look at some of the videos. So I'm just going to go grab this video. Let's grab the, the the shareable link. So in that way, or just simply if you open up YouTube and you found a video, um, I'm just going to go straight into YouTube. Here's a here's the video itself playing. Um, you can actually just go and copy it right here at the top. You can copy that if you want to, or you can use the share option. Click on the share option and get that link. So any kind of way that you would normally link to a YouTube video, you just copy that. Google Forms wants things to be in YouTube for the most part. Um, I know there are exceptions to that with a URL that sometimes works. But it's it's actually just easier just to do that, and um, so we just go to URL and we just paste it in there, and there we go. There we can insert our video into um, our form, and we've got the same functionality. We can resize it if we want to make it very big. We can use the options, and the options will allow us to left align, center align, or right align. So now what gets quite what, a nice thing that you can do, for example, is include a video into your form. And then add questions to that video underneath the the um, add the questions to that video for example so let's say i'm going to say watch this um, video and then answer the following questions right so you can do this in a number of different ways um, so there's a caption we can add for the video as well if we want. I'm just going to take that away because we've already kind of explained it here with watch the video and then answer the following questions. So yeah, I've got my video inserted into my form. So let's go have a look at what the form looks like now. Um, we're going to click on preview. And there we've got our form. We've got our information filled in. And then we scroll down and there's a whole bunch of things. So as we add things to our form, it becomes quite a lengthy thing to scroll through and it becomes it can easily become a little bit messy um, when this form just keeps on going and keeps on going and keeps on going. Um, so the last thing I want to show you and then I'm going to open up the floor a little bit for questions because I know we're going through quite a lot of um, information. Um, is how this last little button works here called section. So just to go through the buttons again, we've got the add a question. We can import questions if we want to. We can add just a text, um, just pure text somewhere. We can add images. We can add a video and then we can add sections. So what the section does, um, and I like to find a spot that I'm, I'm going to scroll to. So I'm going to scroll to this point and I want to add my section. Actually, I'm going to click on that. So if we click on a question and we say add section, you'll see what happens is the form is broken up into two sections. So I've got section one over here, right at the top. I've got section one, and, and then I've got section two. And I've got this useful ability to just collapse the section. Right, can you see there I've collapsed the section? So now I don't need to scroll, especially that school one, that's a long one. And it's easy for me to, re to move questions around at this stage. When these things, when this thing is collapsed, so that's what this little button does. Expand it again, so now all my questions show, and then collapse it again, and then it goes away, right? And again, we've got our little, our three buttons, which allows us, or the right-click option allows us to do a couple of things. Importantly, we can move the section, and we can duplicate the section, and of course, be careful, don't delete the section. 
on that note, yeah. one thing, and I do want to to warn you about Google Forms. Um, like all other Google tools, it saves automatically online, so you don't need to go and look for the save button. As you'll see by now, I've never pressed the save button because everything that I do happens real time, which is a great thing because if you've set up a form and you've already sent it out to everyone and you pick up, wait, there's a mistake, go in, change it, and it'll change on their side as well, except obviously if they've already completed the form. But this is quite a nice way where you can fix um, things. Uh, just quickly on a side note, um, Sanele, I see your video is is sharing. Will you just please um, see if you can switch off your video? So Sanele, it's just going to save everyone a little bit of bandwidth, please. Right. So um, just to get back into this, so now we've got we've got section one over there. Let's go to section two. So what's nice now is section two. Let's just close that. We don't want that to expand. Now it starts with a header and I can say untitled section and um, yeah, I can add whatever I want to call it. So now we're just going to call it content. Gives me the same kind of details. I've got the option to add a description and now I just have the rest of my things in here. Um, so let's have a look at what happens now. But when once we start adding sections, it becomes a little bit more tricky to preview our forms effectively. So let me show you what happens. If I'm going to take preview, here we go, there's my form, but it stops there. Now I've got a next button, which takes me to the next section of my form. But have a look at what happens. If I click next, it doesn't allow me to go on because I actually first need to enter this information. So when you are setting up forms, this can be quite an, a frustrating thing. So I often say set up the whole form and add sections later. Sections are a very nice way to not overwhelm the attendees because um, we don't want them to, to open up this form and then just start scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling until they, they get tired and they just close the form. So rather add sections which groups your information into certain bits and pieces. Um, but again, it's a good idea to add these sections at the end because obviously we're going to want to make a lot of our questions compulsory. So at the moment, I've only got name that is compulsory, but let's say I want to add surname needs to be a required question as well. We're going to change a couple of these things. We want to make this very long list. We're not going to make that required, but this we want to make required and this one we want to make required as well. So this becomes a, a and now if I'm going to preview my form in order to look at what my second section looks like, I actually first need to complete everything. So I need to add a number of things. I'm just going to add things very quickly here. We're just going to select the very first date that we can. Now I can go next. And that becomes a bit of a hassle if you have to enter that every time. But have a look at example form. It's still going to call it. It's still using the title at the top, but now I've just got this little section added to it. Content and I can continue adding information and submit it at the end. Right. I'm going to pause there for a minute and then just open up the floor. Are there any questions around the forms specifically? The things that I've shown you so far. I see the chat is dead quiet. Andrea, there's nothing happening over there. Nope, I have not seen anything you're explaining so well. Uh, but just the one thing, I think your video might be lagging just a little bit, so maybe just slow down your navigation when okay. you scroll and stuff like that. You're... Right, I'll do that. Um, so, so far, so good. No questions. Everyone understands. Okay, then if everyone understands, I think I'm going to show you a little trick that I thought I'm going to leave for the advanced um, tricks at the end, which which is a very useful thing to be able to add to a form. Um, and that is the ability to jump to sections based on answers. So what if we've got multiple choice questions, I'm just going to delete this question on the school because I always need to, this thing takes forever to scroll. Um, scroll right, so let me just quickly delete that one because it takes too long to scroll through that. 
Right, so now I've only got these these sections. Right, I've got this and this and this. Right, now with multiple choice questions, and it only works with multiple choice questions, you need to use these questions in order to navigate our form. So let's say male and female, these are the two options that we're going to use. If you look at the bottom of section one, it says after section one, continue to next section. We can change that and we can say after section one, we're actually going to go to submit form. Right, so in other words, if they if they just fill in section one, their option is going to be submit form. Um, so what's going to happen? We're going to submit this quickly. We're going to go to preview. Let's enter my name. My name is still AA. And I'm just going to go to submit. So I need to select something. Submit. And it's just going to say, thank you. Your response has been recorded. So I've actually skipped section two um, if I've set it up this way. But maybe what we want to do is we want to make sure section two can be skipped by all males. But if you're female, we would like you to actually complete that. So what we do now is we go back to this right click option, the three dots, and we're going to go go to section based on answer. And now I've got this option. So now it opens up here. And it's going to open up these things um, on all of them. So now I need to change this to if they select male, I'm just going to submit the form. If they select female, I will go to section two. And if they select other, I'll also go to section two. So what this does is it gives me the option to kind of create a navigational tree. Um, why is this useful? A simple example, if you need to collect information from both the learners and the parents, but you want to have kind of the same information, but it needs to branch off a little bit then you just add one of these questions and that will make sure that you either go to section two. So just to give you a sense, we're going to change this to content for females. And we'll go right to the bottom and I'm going to add a section and I'm going to call this content for males. And I'm just going to add a, a little thing here. You are here because you said you are a male. Right. So there's section three is content for males. Section two is content for females. So you can do this in a number of different ways. So for example, in a in a quiz environment, you can ask them the first question, how would you rate your expertise on the subject? As an example. Um, and then if they say good, it takes them to a certain set of questions. If it says average, it takes them to this set of questions. Or you can say, how much help do you need? And if it says they need a lot of help, it'll take them to the whole form. If it says just a little bit, it'll take them to a small part of the form. And I've seen people do amazing things with Google Forms based on this. The whole kind of um, you navigate your own way based on your own answers, finding the kind of things that you want to find, which which becomes an incredibly interesting and engaging experience for learners once you start doing that. So let's just go back to this question that we have. So over here we go. If they're going to select female, they're going to go to content for females. If they're going to select male, they're going to go to content for males. And if they're going to select other, we're just going to submit the form because then they're not going to go to either one of those. So let's see what this actually does in practice. I'm going to say preview. We'll get to this point. We're just going to say our name is again this and this. Now we're going to say male, select the birth date, and say next. And you'll see now I've gone here, content for males. You are here because you said you are a male. Because there are no questions, it's just going to ask me to submit. If we press back, we can say female, we're going to say next. And here we get to the content for females. So this becomes a very useful and very, very handy way of collecting information um, when we need to use that information for whatever it is that we want to use it for. So just to go back to this example form, now we've collected information in any way that we want. 
But remember, collecting the information on its own means very little to us if we can't actually process that information in some way. So in order to get to the responses that we that we are going to receive for the form, you'll see there is a tab that calls itself responses. Click on responses and you'll see here are the responses I've received so far. And what Google does is it'll try and based on the types of questions that you've asked, it's going to draw up little graphs. It'll give you um, a breakdown of the responses. You have a number of options. So I'm going to go back to that. Um, that first form that that you had to complete. Let me just quickly grab that one. I'm going to pull it up in here. So here's the form that I built for that, just to show you how this, this one would look. So here I've got a linear question. How would you rate your knowledge of G Suite? And I said one to five, and yeah, the option's still learning. Good luck teaching me anything. Um, I'm happy with that question. I can click here, another linear question, and here I've got my um, my multiple choice questions. Uh, not multiple choice, the, the um, checkbox questions. Now, when I go to responses, you've got different ways of looking at the responses and the tabs are here at the top. So if my first thing I want to have a look at, what did people say? How would they rate their knowledge of G Suite? I'm going to click on the question and I'll see. OK, so these are the responses I received. I received a total of nine responses and here they are individually. So three people said four, three people said one, two people said three and one person said five. And now we can click on next. And again, now we can go and analyze all of these things. Um, so a question by question look at what the people said. Individual allows you to have a look at the individual questions. So yeah, I see the first person answered everything and thinks they're amazing. That was my answer. And the second person, they attended all four fundamentals and they actually regard their own knowledge as being quite good. The third person, um, is quite in the middle. They only attended Google Fundamentals once, so having going and revised, reviewing the video recordings we made for two, three, and four is hopefully going to boost that three um, to a higher to a higher ranking, and so forth and so forth. Um, this isn't entirely useful because I haven't actually asked them the key questions like what's your name and surname to be able to know who it is that is telling me these things. So. Um, again, the design of this form was not was intentionally anonymous. I didn't want to put people in the position where I wanted to see what um, Francina's one was or Tamsin or Lynette or Andrea, what they said about their um, their ability with Google. It was supposed to be anonymous, but very often when you collect information, you can't have it be anonymous. You want them to to um, to actually have a key and or give you feedback based on who they are. So those are usually your first questions, name, surname. And then the next one I want to look at, if we're going to go back to our example form and our questions, and we'll get to the responses, becomes a little bit more, I suppose, especially when we get to the quiz, the responses become quite an important little thing to look at. When we are collecting information, one of the most useful ways to identify people on the internet is with their email address. Now, what you can do, of course, is we can add a question. So we're going to have name and surname. And we'll add a question that says email. And this will automatically give us the short answer option. And remember, when we go to response validation, and this is an important little trick to remember, to go to response validation, and then you select text, contains, or not text, contains, we're going to select email address. And then they have to enter a valid email address. Unfortunately, this, this does not mean they enter a correct email address. It just requires them to enter a valid email address. A different way of going about this is when we go to our settings of our form. Right, so that's the next step we want to take. How do we make sure that the settings of our form are correct? Unlike my form that I sent out to you in the beginning that you didn't have access to. Because I sent you a form and you said, well, I can't open it up and this is a problem. The gear icon. Now let's revise the icon so far. This one's going to change the theme. Don't worry about the puzzle icon because this is the, the really advanced fancy things that we're not going to go into at all today. 
But if you want to look at Google Forms add-ons, they add a lot of cool functionality to the form. Um, this is the preview. Absolutely vital to have a look at what your form is going to look like. And then we get to the gear icon, the settings. So if we click on the settings icon, you'll see there's a couple of settings that have been have been activated um, or, or a few options here. The general ones that we have by default, because I'm using from this one, I'm using my um, Western Cape Education Department account. If you are in a school that has a G Suite account, um, usually the default setting is that one is on. And that's why when I sent you the other one, you couldn't actually um, you couldn't actually give me feedback. So what I want to be able to do is I actually want to be able to untick that, which means now it's open to anyone to answer. If I want to limit, if I want to collect email address over here, it automatically adds the question collect email address. Now what's nice about this is if a person is logged in with a Gmail account, it will collect that Gmail account without them having to retype it, which means you actually get the correct email account and not some random other email account that you need to use. The problem with this is it excludes other email addresses. So it's a 50-50 it's a kind of call between the two. I want to often do this, but we can't exclude people. Um, so we have to open it up that people type their own email addresses, but people get their own email addresses wrong a lot, unfortunately. You might be, be sitting in a position where you missed out on a notification about a training and you're still wondering why Yaku never sent me an invite to that thing. It's probably because the email address wasn't correct because we, on average, we get about um, between five and 10% of pre-registration email addresses are wrong. And then we can't send out invitations to them. So collect email address is a useful thing to do. The response receipt is usually something I don't activate, but this essentially just means that um, they can get a copy of the response that they sent in. Um, I generally don't switch, don't turn it on. I just leave it off, but it depends on what you want to use. Limit to one response. This will require them to actually have a Google account, to use a Google account. It's not going to work with other things because Google can then keep track of has so-and-so already filled in this form. If they have, then it's going to say you can't fill it in again. If they haven't, it'll allow you to fill it in. Quite a useful trick if you're going to do a slightly more formal type of assessment with learners and you don't want them to be able to answer the thing multiple times. Um, and then edit after submission. See summary charts and text responses. I think this is kind of self-explanatory. Summary charts and text responses. My advice definitely is never put that on. Otherwise, people can go and review what other people answered, etc. We don't want to do that most of the time. If I go to presentation, um, there's a show progress bar. So if you've got a very long thing and you've got a lot of different sections, each section is seen as a page. So you might have joined sections where it says completed one of 22 pages. It doesn't mean that you're going to complete all 22 pages. It just means there are 22 sections. You might actually only fill in three or four of them. I like to actually leave this one off um, because I find that it actually scares people away from wanting to complete this. So generally, I like to not activate that. And then shuffle question order, um, it depends a lot on, on the type of thing that you're going to do. Most of the surveys, I don't think you're ever going to want to shuffle your questions. And then the confirmation message is quite a useful one because in the confirmation message, you can add anything that you want, including links. If you're going to add, you can't make something, uh, click here and then try and change that into a hyperlink. That. So there's no way of changing that into a hyperlink or anything like that, but you can, for example, add a link like that and Google will automatically pick up that as a link. Um, it is limited because you can't have, you don't have paragraphs, you don't have any other kind of functionality. It's just a little text that appears there. But if you want them to, if you want to say, um, thank you for registering, go have a look at our, our school's website so long and you enter your school's website address, it's a nice way of getting them to go onto your website and visit and revisiting things. So a useful little trick with a presentation. All right. Um, <clears throat> what I want you to do now quickly before we're going to go on, I just want to see if everyone is still with us, everyone's still hanging in there. So um, please, all of you at this point in time in Teams, 
press the raise your hand icon just to show me that you're still here. Right, I'm going to raise my hand. You see, we've got two people with us. The rest of you are hopefully still looking for the raise your hand option. All right, don't lower them yet. I see some people already lowered their hand. I'm going to tell you when to lower your hand. Um, right, I see. It, we've got at least half of you still still with us, and the other half, I think, are. I'm going to tell myself the other half are looking for the raise their hand option. Right. So before we dive into quiz into the quiz option functionality, are there no questions at this point in time? Nothing that you've always wanted to be able to do with forms, but you don't know how to, or you don't know if it's possible. Um, you're more than welcome to try and stump me. I like it when people ask me questions that I can't answer. That means I need to go and find answers. So you can you can lower your hand now, unless if you actually have a question. All right, I see there's only one hand. Rihanna, do you have a question? OK, no, she doesn't have a question. Right, so let's go into the quiz functionality of Google um, Forms. Now, before I even start with the quiz function, what I would like to point out, um, when using Google Forms in conjunction with Google Classroom and you've got a G Suite on, there's a lot of extra functionality that comes into this. Specifically, it's going to be able to pick up who your learners are so that it automatically assigns marks to them. Um, Google Classroom does kind of work um, when you do that with Gmail accounts because I know a lot of schools don't have um, Google tenants running yet. Um, so it does work to an extent, but from my experience when using a Gmail account in Google Classroom, it doesn't always do the auto marking, auto grading and adding the grades to my markbook as well as I would like it to do. So so that sometimes doesn't work um, as effectively as, as I would like it to work. So what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at Google Forms, using Google Forms as if you don't have that function, as if you're not running on a Google tenant, because I'm sure those of you running on a Google tenant would have explored the option of a quiz that can mark itself because which teacher wouldn't want something to mark a tool that can do our marking for us? So um, we're going to explore this as if you don't have that knowledge, as if you don't have that that, that understanding. Um, I'm just going to take a a two minute break. I just need to grab a glass of water, and then we're going to and then we're going to dive into it again. So you're more than welcome to stand up. Um, and just quickly stretch your legs before we get before we dive into the second part of our training session and use this time to think of any questions that we haven't covered yet. <clears throat> okay, um, that was a very short two minutes, I know, but we've got a lot of things that we that I'd still like us to cover in this session as far as possible. Right, so we're going to go back to how do we create a Google quiz. Now, just for 
the sake of starting uh, starting fresh, we're going to close all of that. I'll go and I'll delete it at a later stage. And the quiz in the form is created in exactly the same way. The difference being a Google um, a Google form. Oh, sorry, uh, um, a, a Google quiz is essentially a way of changing a Google form around. So what you can do just to show you the different approaches here, I could open up a new tab, go to the waffle and click on forms. And it's going to give me this landing page over here where if you open it up, there is a couple of useful templates over here. So if you click on this expand option, it shows you a number of different templates. Um, here are a couple of ones that have been loaded already built in by the, the Cape Winans that they use. Ach, not the Cape Winans, the Western Cape. And there's the general ones that you will also have um, on your hand. So you can actually use these templates and import them and modify them um, in whatever way that you want. But for what we want to do is we want to create a quiz. So if I click on a blank quiz, what it does is it opens up a blank form which changes into a quiz, but we end up with that same headache of it's just going to go to your My Drive folder and it's going to make everything a bit of a mess eventually. So I still suggest going into Google Drive, the same way we created the example form, right clicking over here and saying Google Forms. Um, so here we're going to say it gives you the option from template. So if you want to, we can click on and say from template. Or we can just click on the form and I'll go straight into a Google form. It's going to get us to the same point. Now what we want to do before we even start with this thing, we're going to go to the settings. And we're going to go to quizzes. And we change it to make this a quiz. Right, so let's just go through that process again. We click on settings. We click on quizzes and we're going to say make this a quiz. Now I didn't make it a quiz last time because I didn't press save. Um, what are two options here? Now Chromebooks, unfortunately, if you have Chromebooks, you're very fortunate. We're not going to even go into that because very few people have. Um, these are two key things we're going to return to later, the immediately after each submission or later after manual review, because this is actually one of the very often overlooked functions of Google Quiz. Um, that I think adds a lot of value when we use it effectively. Then we've got the respondents can see a missed question, correct answers, point values. You can decide what you want them to see. You want them to actually answer this thing. And when you return it to them, they see what they did right and what they did wrong. Sometimes when you do this immediate um, kind of marking thing, teachers don't want them to be able to know the kind of marks that they got or the correct answers because other learners are still working on it. Um, but that depends entirely on how you're going to, how, how you want to um, implement the, the system into, um, or implement this when you're setting up a quiz. Um, for now, I'm going to leave everything just like it is. I'm going to say save. There's a new little function that really makes life a lot easier. And again, if we go to these three little dots over here, now we haven't gone all the way there. We've slowly been making our way over there. We get to the three dots. There's a new little thing that they've added that's quite useful, and it's right here at the bottom. It's called preferences. Now, if I go to preferences, there's two question, two little tick boxes that I find incredibly useful. The first one, if I'm setting up a quiz specifically, I don't I, I use these when setting up a survey, but when setting up a quiz, this makes life so much easier. First one is make questions required. That means all the questions are going to be required. I don't have to go and click required, required, required. Remember the default setting for a new question is that it's not required. We want to make sure they have to fill in everything. So we're going to say make questions required. And then this next one, default quiz point value, just to tick it up to one. So now a multiple choice question is automatically going to count one instead of zero, which just makes sense. Just note these default settings that you see over here. This means that every Google quiz or Google Forms that quiz that you set up will automatically have these settings enabled. So it's nice to have them enabled. And then sometimes when you want to set up a survey and you don't want the question required, you just go in there and change the setting again. So we'll just save that. And now when we add a new question, automatically is one point and it's required. 
Now, let's just go and delete that. Now we want to create our first question. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up a little Romeo and Juliet quiz here for them. Romeo and Juliet. Right, so there we go. Romeo and Juliet. They're going to answer the questions on Romeo and Juliet. Now you'll notice it works exactly the same in terms of adding questions. I can add a multiple choice question. Um, so, for example, our first question we want to add, and yeah, we've just got a couple of preset questions. I'm just copying from a from a Google Doc, so um, I'm not the world's fastest typer when I do these things. Who wrote Romeo and Juliet? Is the first question. And now I've got four options. This is in a Google Doc. Please note when you're copying information, because we act, we this is something we didn't touch on with a survey. When you're going to copy information, when you copy from a, an Excel sheet or a Google sheet, each cell will be regarded as a new row. In Word, it works the same. Word or um, Docs, it works the same. Each new paragraph, so in other words, if there's an enter between the two, it treats it as a new row. So I've just selected um, four rows. I'm going to paste them there, and there I've got my options. William Wallace, William Shakespeare, William Wordsworth, Wordsworth, uh, or William Blake, who wrote Romeo and Juliet. Now, we're not going to give them another option because it has to be one of those. But the first thing you need to make sure of, remember this is our first question. So our first question, we didn't have that setting enabled. So make sure it's a required question, step number one. Step number two, there needs to be an answer. Right, so at this point in time, I'm asking them a question, but I haven't actually told Google what the correct answer is yet. So if we want to do that, we're going to click on answer key. And answer key will bring us to the, this point where we can now choose which one is the correct answer. We're going to assign a point value. Remember, our other questions are all going to count one mark. So we've already set that one up. Um, and now we need to select which one is the correct one. William Shakespeare is the correct one. And now we get to the feedback option. When you, when you spend a lot of time developing these forms, the feedback becomes such a useful tool to have. And especially when we compare it to a number of other quiz tools that are out there, because there's a lot of other quiz tools out there. Quizzes is one that I really enjoy. Quizlet is a great tool. Kahoot is one of those, um, almost the grandfather of, of, of these things. Lots of people have used it before. But Google Forms is especially good with a feedback function that it has. So what, what the feedback means is based on the answers, they give, they get certain responses. So an incorrect answer, it's going to tell them, um, please try again. Uh, let's just check that. A correct answer is well done. And I can even go as far as to add certain things. So yeah, incorrect answer, let's say I'm going to add that link to um, and now, if I had a link, um, it's just going to say it's going to link to google.com. I'm going to say go Google it. Right. Um, so there's just a quick link to google.com and correct answers. Yeah, I can even add a video. If I click on the YouTube option, let's just look for a yay. This is something we didn't look at last time. So you can actually um, mention. Okay, right, so yeah, it's going to give us a whole bunch of different things. Um, free man cheering, green screen effect. Let's just select that one. So now it's actually going to add a video when they get that answer. Save. So let's just have a quick look at what that actually is going to look like. We'll use the preview button. Here's my first question. I need to answer it. I'm going to say William. Let's say William Wallace and submit. And now I can say view score. And when I say view score, it gives me the feedback that we spoke about, right? So we're going to say submit another response because at the moment I haven't locked it yet. So I'm allowing lots of responses. Let's select William Shakespeare. I'm going to say submit. This time I got it right. So if I click on view score, it tells me I got it right and it says well done. And there's a video of a man cheering me and telling me well done that I need to play. Now, 
OK, that's a very strange video, so let's just stop it. Um, so in other words, what you need to keep in mind, what you would normally use the video function for is exactly the reverse of what I did now. If they answered incorrectly and there's a useful video that they could link to that will explain this, whether it's a video that you've made or another video that you've sourced, anything that's on YouTube, that's quite a nifty way of, of doing that, of actually making sure that they um, go to that type of video to explain a detail, something for them. Or if it's a question that's a little bit tricky, you can just simply with text explain to them why it can't be, why it must be what a different answer, what is wrong with it. So you don't have to add feedback. So that's the next thing I want to show you. So let's say I'm going to add another question this time. And this is what are we going to do here is we're actually going to, this is a quiz question, but we're going to ask them to type something. And there's something I want you to take note of here. Which family is Romeo part of? But we're going to make this a short answer. The quiz most of the time doesn't want you to use short answers. There's a very specific reason for this, and that is they need to type the answer exactly like you are typing it. So we're going to say answer key, and we need to give them the correct answer. So Romeo is part of the Montagues, right? But now the question is, am I spelling it correctly? Montague. Can you see the problem? If they don't know how to spell it correctly, even if it's a, even if it's the, these two answers I would like to point out are different answers. This one with a lowercase m and the uppercase m, these are not the same answers. Now, I think I'm not 100% sure. I know some, an issue that I had in the past, I think they've corrected it by now, is even this with a space is not the same as without the space, but I think it's something that has been fixed. For that reason, I, for the most part, often say be careful of um, all other answers are incorrect. I always say be careful of using this type of question, a question that is um, a short answer because people, because learners might have the correct answer. They might, they, they, it could possibly be that they should and they deserve to get the right marks, but they just misspelled the name. Now, um, from my background, I'm an I was an English high school teacher. In a sense, I would say, well, you need to be able to spell it correctly in order to get the marks. I know that's not technically how the assessment works, but I always felt that you should be able to spell the family of the main character's name correctly, at least. Um, so remember, this is very useful for informal assessment. I wouldn't recommend using um, Google Forms for a formal assessment necessarily. We, we could look at something if we have time a little bit later, how you can use it for a formal assessment, which is quite useful. Um, but in terms of in terms of, of just simply a, um, a quick informal assessment, I think it's OK sometimes to use questions like that. Most of the time, I really recommend that you use primarily multiple choice questions. With that said, let's have a look at how you could possibly use um, the check boxes. Now, the difference between the check box and the multiple choice, the radial button, is that the check box, they can actually select multiple answers. So if we were to go to our first question and we were to change this into a, um, sorry, we just need to say done. So we can change it again. If we were to change this into check boxes, that means they can say that William Shakespeare was written by Wordsworth, um, uh, by, by William Wallace, William Wordsworth, William Shakespeare, and William Blake, um, which we know is obviously not the case. Um, when we use these, have a look at what we are going to do here, which makes it quite useful. Which of the following characters are all part of the Capulet family? Now I've added four options. Um, but in this case, two of them are and two of them aren't. So we can't only select one. We want to be able to select two. So now we're going to go to the check boxes option. We're going to go to the answer key and now we need to tick the correct one. So Juliet and Tybalt. Iron Man is obviously not part of it and Q is also not part of it. 
and we can add feedback if we want to, but we're not going to add feedback. Now, if you want to, because this is two answers that they're giving and not only one, we can say this it counts two points. What you have to be mindful of is that doesn't mean if they get one of them right, they automatically get one point. It's either everything right or everything wrong. That's how these things work. So you need to get it 100% correct or you will get it wrong. Um, so we're going to say done. Please note, I know that Google, this is one of the, these are some of the things that Google said that are working on in forms to allow this kind of thing that only means you need to get one of them and you get one of the marks, et cetera, et cetera. But as far as I know, it's not actually working that way yet. So now we've got a couple of questions already. We've got our first one, who wrote Romeo and Juliet? Which family is Romeo part of? Which of the following characters are all part of the Capulet family? And now we're going to go to one of the other types of questions that we said we're not engaging with yet. And that is the. Um, and, and sorry, the question that we all want, want to engage with now is the multiple choice grid. Now, I find these to be quite useful. The checkbox grid, not so much. The checkbox grid, again, this is one of those things that I haven't really used, but I have seen people use it very well and very effectively. Um, and it works. It, it, it's actually quite a nifty way of asking questions if you wrap your head around it. But between these two, these can be a little bit more confusing to get right. So let's have a look at the multiple choice grid. What's going to happen now is this is this not exactly like match the row and the column, but it, to a certain extent, this is kind of what's going to be happening. What happens is we have got rows. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, who said it? I'm going to ask the question, who said it? One of the things I really think is important um, when it comes to uh, um, uh, Shakespeare in general is, is for learners to try and understand who says which quote. So what I'm going to do, I've got a couple of quotes that I've got prepared here already. So there are six different quotes. So these are six quotes that have been said by three characters. I'm going to add the character names in here. Romeo, Juliet, and Friar Lawrence. Right, so there I've got this set up. Now I'm going to go to my answer key. Now you'll notice with the answer key, um, what it often does is it'll take the previous questions um, answers, two points, and I'll just decide, okay, well, this one's probably also going to be two points. So sometimes it's, it, it tries to make predictive um, responses and it doesn't always do it so well. Again, you can kind of play around with um, the, these options, etc. if you want to require response. A lot of it is quite self-explanatory once you understand how the thing works. Let's have a look at the answer key. So now what you see over here is essentially what the um, what they are going to see on their side. They're going to see the quote and they're going to see the column. Who was the one that said it? So the first one, do not swear by the moon for she changes. This was Juliet. That's the kiss I die. That's Romeo. Why is and so there's some of the best for Lawrence. Denmark, love, and half of Swedish side. That was also Romeo. That was also Friar Lawrence. And that was Juliet. Right. So now with all of these, I actually get the option to assign points based on the answer. So I'm going to say the first one is one point. That one is one point. This one is one point. That one is one point. And this one is an important one. So I'm going to make that one five points. And here I go. This one counts 10 points. So here it's actually quite nice because it's not a case of get all of it right or get and get or you get none of the marks. They get marks based on how many they get right. So we could change this just to have a look at what happens if we say checkbox grid. So now we're going to change it into a checkbox grid and the same kind of applies here. The checkbox grid is just now I can say that three people said it and if they only say one person, they won't get the mark. So the checkbox grid works very much in the same way. It's just, as I said, it's not something that I've really used um, in, in the way that I've, I've gone about it. But this is especially, I think, with uh, the multiple choice, this is especially a, oh, now I think I've ruined my whole thing. Yes, I have. Um, especially with the, with the, um, uh, just get that in there again and just get an answer key set up. Juliet, um, Oh, that was Romeo, that was Fra Lawrence. Uh, 
um, so it's not that. Right, so um, as you see, if you change it to the wrong question type, the whole thing disappears. Uh, make that five again. And there we, there we go. Right, so we've got our thing set up. I think this is a very nice way that you can use Google Forms to, to kind of get lots of questions in quickly. Remember, it's, it's, it's nice for learners that they can navigate through this quickly and answer questions quickly, etc. The last one I want to show you, and for all language teachers for a second, you're going to get excited about this, but I want you to take note of this. Very important to, to, to understand. If we're going to add a question, and we add a question like this. Discuss this is the sincerity of Romeo's love for Juliet when juxtaposed with his love for Rosaline. I know it's quite a complicated question, but there's only one way to answer this, and that is with a paragraph. Now, you'll see there's something that says answer key, but unfortunately, there's no way that any paragraph can be marked automatically. There's no system that does this. There are systems that might be able to analyze the level of language used, but that's the extent of it. So no one's going to do it for us. We need to do it ourselves, and I'm going to show you how that happens. So we click on answer key. This one is going to count um, 10 marks. And you'll see there's actually no. Way that I can go to say, but this is the correct answer because it's a paragraph. It's impossible to give a correct answer for a paragraph. Now. Now I've got a quiz that actually counts out of 24, and it's been set up quite quickly, I think. And once you start working with Google quizzes, you'll you'll quickly discover that being able to copy from things that you've already get, got set up, going on to the internet and finding a little quiz and saying, okay, but I want to use some of this, you'll figure out ways to copy information from that. What I can tell you works very well is Sometimes going onto a going onto a website, finding these quizzes that you want to be able to use, you can get the problem is if you get your learners to go and answer those quizzes, you don't know how they did. So we want to be able to get that information. How are our learners doing in understanding this content? What are they are they are they getting from it? Um, then, oftentimes it works well to just copy that information from there into a Google Doc because. Um, Google is obviously a lot, a lot more clever when it comes to taking information from a Google Doc and putting it in here. These are a few tricks that I've picked up in the past um, that have made life easier for me when copying, trying to, to essentially get that information from somewhere into a Google form. Um, there are other ways of doing it, but that becomes quite complicated. So we've got our whole thing set up. Let's look at what, it, what, what happens now when we try and answer it. So we're going to go into the preview. And everything is nice and required already because we changed that setting in the beginning. We don't have to go through this whole process. There's even a, there are plugins that allow you to change everything to required, but just set that setting in the beginning and then you don't need to struggle with it again. So now we're going to go to the preview. So our first question we're going to answer, we know this is William Shakespeare. We're going to say Montague. Uh, let's do that, Montague. Right. So. That's how I thought we we're going to spell Montague. Here we're going to select um, uh, Judith and Tybalt, and here we're just going to say Judith was the one to say everything here. And the last one we're going to say um, does discuss the sincerity, and we're just going to say it's not. Submit. So now I can view my score, and let's see how I did. View score. And immediately, and just before we scroll down, you need to understand that the process behind this, what's great for learners, is we often hand out tests or all sorts of things to determine if our kids know what's going on. But this, the time that has to go from them writing the test to getting feedback on whether or not they understand it is so long that by the time they actually want to answer the questions, they've forgotten what this whole thing is about. Right. Um, I see there is a question. So, Siswe, um, I'm going to allow you to unmute so that you can ask your question. Right. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Just click on the microphone button to unmute yourself.
Okay, I'm going to go on so long. See if you can uh, if you can get yourself unmuted if you have that question, um, Sizwe, because we can't hear you at the moment. All right, so let's have a look at how I did. I've got 10 out of 24, which by no accounts is a great score. Now let's see where did this whole thing go wrong. I got one out of one for the first question. Okay, I got Montague. I thought I had that right, but these are the answers, and it's not quite spelled correctly which is a bit of an issue. Now, yeah, I've got two out of two. I'm happy with that. OK, I've got that one right, this one wrong, this one wrong, that one right, this one wrong, that one. I've got five out of five, so I should do quite well. And yeah, I've got zero out of 10 because I can't mark this. This cannot be marked automatically. Now, this is a problem. And here comes a little trick that you need to keep in mind. So let's go back to the. I'm going to go back to the form. So this is how I did in my Quiz, I'm not particularly happy with that. So now let's go to the responses and see what the responses look like. Here I've got my insights. How are my learners doing in this one so far? So the first one got zero and this one got one. Unfortunately for them, they actually only completed two questions. So it's not really a fair judgment of what happens. So you'll see the summary is quite nice in the sense that you get to see the insights here, how kids are scoring on average. There's a frequently missed questions part over here. Um, so you can see, so what are they getting wrong? So as a teacher, I can immediately see, OK, but I need to have a look at this thing because the family that Romeo is part of is an absolutely crucial part of this whole play. I can't have none of my kids understand that. Over here, OK, at least if nothing else, they know that Shakespeare wrote William, uh, that Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet. So that's a start. Not a good one, but it's a start at least. Um, and I can see the responses over here and I can see how it went. And here I've just got the it's not, which isn't a great answer, but I don't know if it necessarily deserves zero. So here I can go question by question. And this is where it gets where we can start having a look at changing things around. And that's why the auto marking thing is useful when you've just got a whole long list of multiple choice then an auto marking quiz is great. And I use those a lot. It's a great way to just quickly determine if kids know what's going on. You'll give them 10 questions on um, on whatever it is, 20, 30, 40, 50. 50 questions doesn't even take that long if all they're doing is they're just selecting things. And of course, um, all of you that are in this session have filled in a Google form. You all know that it is not an incredibly painful thing. It works wonderfully well on a mobile device as well. So I think because we use Google Forms a lot in our training platform these days, a lot of teachers are a lot more exposed to it and can now get a sense of how you will go about setting them up and understanding how to use them. But from here, I can now actually go and change certain things. So if I go to the, okay, the first person who answered, we know that wasn't great. That wasn't a great thing. Actually, let's go to the individual. Because they, oh, let's go to this one, right, to this question. So now I'm looking at the second question, and I see the responses that learners actually added. And I see Montague, and I think, okay, well, it's not correctly spelled, but it's close enough. We're going to give it, I'm going to say that's fine. And now it gets changed, the mark. But the problem is the learner's already been able to see that mark instantly before the so the scores were released immediately. So he never actually got to know whether or not he's right. Let's go to the next one. So we'll open up this one and we see, OK, they got it right. This is fine. Over here, we look at it and now we can actually go and respond to um, the way it was answered. Now, the one thing about the, um, the radial, this one over here, it's not always so responsive, but luckily, because it's fixed, it should be correct. We shouldn't have to worry too much about what um, what they are, what they were saying, because our auto marking thing would be able to pick this up correctly. Um, it's specifically when we've got these ones, the ones where they need to answer by filling something in. And now we can go to the last one, which is where it becomes very nice. And here I can see uh, the ungraded responses. So in other words, it's not, it's an ungraded response. Um, I can look at it and I can say, okay, this is response three. I think these are the ones, okay. So 
It's doing a couple of funny things because I gave, I added responses to this before I actually really had questions in here. So now I'm going to go to ungraded response, and this is the answer. It's not. I'm going to say this is at least two marks because he wrote two words. We'll give him two marks for writing two words, and that's what we're going to accept. If you click on mark correct, it's going to give them full marks there. But because it's a paragraph and we've got a little bit of room, wiggle room, we're probably not going to give them full marks, but we can give them two marks. Um, change that. Two marks and say save. If you don't save it, it's not going to update the answer. Why is it not updating now? Come now. Save. Okay, there we go. It was misbehaving for a second. So we can do it like that, where we cycle through the individual questions, which is actually quite a, a nice way to go mar to market. So remember, we only see one or two responses, but if we had 10 responses, all 10 of them would be listed underneath each other. And very importantly, you won't know who said it. Um, that anonymity of learner is actually quite a, an important thing because the anonymity of the learner um, means that there's no prejudice involved in the marking because that's unfortunately something that sometimes happens. We see um, this and this person is actually one of the kids. They surely they're going to get it right. We'll just give them the marks. Now there's an, an anonymity involved, so you're just going to award it like that. An alternative way of doing it, and something I don't necessarily recommend, is going to individuals. And so I can have a look at the individuals who answer the questions. So here I see. So this is the first individual, first entry, next response, next response. Now if you've got a question at the top that says name you're going to know who you, whose thing you're marking. So that 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 prejudice that comes in um, can un unfortunately affect what you do. So let's see this third entry and we can scroll all the way to the bottom and then we see this is the response that he gave. Um, no, no, it shouldn't be that. Let's leave it at two. Right, are you all still with me? I'm hoping so. Now, if we're going to go back to our settings, let's go have a look at the settings again over here and we go to quizzes that's why i say this later after manual review is actually quite a useful setting because what happens now is they're going to submit their answers and again this depends entirely on the type of quiz that you set up if you're going to set up a quiz that is purely multiple choice which is a great thing to do please make i'm not trying to say that you shouldn't do that um, i think those should be the kind of the staple of what you're doing. Multiple choice, uh, multiple choice questions are great for quick knowledge checks to just run through, um, run through the whole thing and make sure that everyone knows what's going on. Very, very useful way of doing it, right? So our alternate, the alternative thing that we can do is um, immediately, oh, sorry, is the later after manual review. So if you've got paragraphs in there, if you've got short questions in there, um, this is a useful thing to do because now I can pick up small little mistakes that learners might have made in spelling or I can pick up, um, I can have those little paragraph questions, even if it's just a five mark question where I want them to respond and I can mark it online. But so now we're going to save all of this. And the next thing that we didn't even look at when we got to the sum, I, I completely forgot about that with the survey is, it doesn't help if we set up all of these things, but we can't get it to our learners. So there's a giant send button over there, which is the best way to do it. I know what some people do is they just copy this link at the top and they send it to people. That works, but it's not a good idea to do it that way. Um, I'm not going to go into detail why, but it really isn't the best idea to do it that way. So we're going to press the send button. So once I press the send button, it opens up this dialogue over here where I've got a number of different ways to send it. Now, the majority of us are, there's one way that most people send out forms, and that's here right in the middle, there's an icon for link, a link. So here I can create a link. It's a very long link, but I can shorten it if I want to. And there I end up using a short link. Now you can go and shorten this even further if you want to by creating a bit.ly, or by creating uh, um, um, something similar to a bit.ly, but do as well as other things, um, tiny URL, there's lots of options. But you can do that if you want to. 
but that's a pretty short link um, in all honesty. So you can copy that and you can email it to your learners. You can paste it in a WhatsApp group. You can put it onto your Google Classroom. You can, if you're using something different, you can add it to any kind of way that you want to communicate it with them. From there, you can create a QR code. The kids can scan it with a QR code. If all of this sounds foreign to you, we've got lots of little quick advertisement break. We have instructional videos on how to create bitlies, how to create QR codes, how to do all of those things. So just um, go have a look at our website and go scratch around. You'll find stuff there. Um, there's an option to embed, but we're not going to use that for the most time. If you know how, if you know what embedding is, you probably know how to do it. If you don't know what it is, then you're not going to use it. So I'm not going to go into that now. Then you can alternatively, you can email it as well. So we can say we're going to send it to, um, if you've got a long list of emails, you can copy a list of emails and paste it in here as well, and it'll send that one directly to you. Um, I'm just going to remove that option because we don't want to automatically collect respondents, Western Cape Education Department email addresses, right? We don't want that because we want to make it open. So I'm going to copy that. I've got my link set up. It's just double checking everything's working fine. We don't want to have that setting activated. We're going to switch it off. Presentation. Um, we don't actually want them to submit a second link, a second answer, so we're going to remove that option. We're going to limit the responses um, to only one, so they have to sign in. So all of those settings, depending on how you want to use it, we're going to set everything up like that. Now we've got a later after manual review, save. Now, a little tip that I want to give you that I think works quite well and something I should have done that I didn't do. Um, if you refer to Google Fundamentals 1, you might have remembered there's this option where you can click on that and open up a guest window. Now, I'm, if I open up a guest window, you're not going to actually see the guest window that I'm going to open. So if I click here in the top um, on that icon, click there, open up the guest window, paste it in there. Then you know you're not using your Google account. You know you're not using a school account. And if it doesn't work then, then something is wrong with the sharing and you need to change that. As with all Google files, if I'm actually in my folder, here I've got my example forms, that I can go and I can make a copy, I can share it with people if I want people to be added as collaborators, etc., etc. So we can do all sorts of things like that, like we do with normal Google files. I'm not going to go into that detail now. Um, <clears throat> so that you know how to do that. What I want us to do now, I'm going to paste this link into our chat, and I want you to quickly see if you can answer it very quickly. Don't worry whether you're going to get it right or wrong. Um, what's going to happen now is we're actually going to end up having um, a whole bunch of answers and no one to link it to. So let's answer, the, answer this quickly and see what happens. Right, I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that. Um, I'm just going to go and I'll show you how that works in a minute as well, because you can delete responses. And let's see how the responses roll in. Remember one thing, it's going to be different. I hope I'm not bothering you while I'm explaining in the background. One thing that's going to be different is once you've answered, you are, will not see that see my score option, right? It's actually not going to be available to you because I, as a teacher, first need to review it and then I will release it. And when I release it, um, in this instance, while I'm collecting an email, I think, am I collecting? Yes, I will be collecting an email because I'm limiting you to one response, it'll send an email back to you how you did. So this is a slightly more advanced way of using it quite often. Um, but yes, just to show you to keep that in mind. OK, I'm going to give you still complete this.
All right, we have three people have completed it. Right, so slowly but surely things are coming in. Please do not write an essay with the last one. This is not a competition to see who is able to have the best worded essay at the end. Um, Right, so what I want us to do now, um, apologies, I just need to get a quick name list. Right, so now we've got seven people have submitted. Let's have a look at what this looks like now. So I've not released the score yet for the individual. We can either go question by question, but I'm not going to do that. Let's just go to the individual. Here we've got the first person said William Blake. It's not William Blake, it's William Shakespeare. They got Montague correct. We're happy about that. Lowercase. They thought that Iron Man is a Capulet. Not exactly. Um, here I've got some of the quotes right. They think Romeo was the only one that spoke during Romeo and Juliet. Um, and the last one is just her. Discuss the sincerity. I think that is the best way to answer that question. Possibly I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10. Now that I've done that, I've actually added all of these marks um, and we can go to the point where we're going to remember we won't be able to release our marks, our scores until everyone has actually been completed. Um, so before you can actually go and release the these marks, you'll first need to go and complete the individual ones and then you'll get to the point where you can release. You'll see there it says scores, score not released. Um, releasing individual scores. Um, there was a second to do that. I'm just trying to see where they put it now. Okay, I think they've changed that now. So we won't be able to release the individual scores. Once you've finished all of these things, then you release it. So it's a catch-22. You need to ask yourself because we want things to be automatically graded, but there's a limitation in how we can grade it. Um, these 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 different scores. So we need to be mindful of of that whole thing that's going to happen. Um, and through in this way, we can cycle through the various, we can cycle through the various ways of checking it. Let's have a look at the summary. Yeah, the summary, um, I just want to see if there's a question over here. I think you see someone, oh, it's Andrea. Um, here we can have a look at how this point scoring looks at the moment. Now remember, it's going to look low because there's a 10 more question at the end that everyone automatically gets zero for until I release the scores. So the rest of it we can scroll through. It looks quite good. Montague, most of us got that one right. William Shakespeare, most of us got that one right. Um, over here, who said it? We struggled a little bit with the who said it part. Um, and then over here, we've got very short things. Romeo was in love with Juliet, where they, where they would do anything for their love. Nooit de boek um, He was tormented by his Right, so here we've got a couple of responses and we can go into detail there. So I'm going to go a little bit quickly because there's a key thing we still need to look at. The problem is we still end up here without knowing who is answering the questions. So first and foremost, our very first question really should be to try and determine who it is that's answering it. 
So we can go to settings and we can collect email addresses, which is an important thing that we want to be able to do. It's going to set this to a certain setting. Now, all the responses will be linked to an email address, which is essentially going to tell us who is answering that question. Another way that you can do it is we can add a question here where we're going to ask for name and surname. When you do this, what I suggest, we want to make sure that they're going to enter it in the same way. And you'll see now why I say we want to do that. So what's useful is to actually just use a class list. So I'm just going to copy names off of a fake class list. These aren't real learners. Um, I'm going to add it over here and I'm going to paste it there. So here they can actually select their name from the class list if it's them. The problem with this naturally is um, that Noble Bunting can decide, I'm going to answer this, but I'm going to say that I'm actually the Zaro Dawkins as an example. So be careful of that. But the reason why we want to be able to do that, if you're going to allow them to type the name, they can do the same thing anyway. That's why the email address is usually a good way to make sure that the person is who they say they are. Because the last thing that we want to look at is when we have the responses, this is one way to view our, to view the, the answers that we are getting. But very often, one of the nicest ways to actually do it is when we have a spreadsheet like this. So this is the last thing we want to look at today because I see we are rapidly running out of time here. And that is the spreadsheet that we're going to create. So if you click on responses, before we do that, I just want to also point out there's a useful button over there that says accepting responses. So if I want to, I can turn it off and then we're done. You had your time. That's it. If it's not folding by a certain time, we're going to close this Google form, um, which is quite a nifty thing to be able to do. If you tell them it needs to be in by tomorrow, 12 o'clock, tomorrow, 12 o'clock, you open up the responses and you just close it and then you make sure they can't send it in again. Another thing it's quite that, that is useful to do, if we go to individuals, we can delete responses. If we don't want certain responses, we can just take say that the person who answered the fifth response was rubbish. We're just going to delete that response. And it gives you a drop down that's going to give you a little bit more detail as to who it is, if there's kind of information pertaining to that. Then the right click option here, I think it's pretty self-explanatory what you're going to do there, response destination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, okay, that's a little bit more tricky, but don't worry about those things. The key thing we want to look at over here, and if you attended Google Fundamentals 4, you had a look at Google Sheets, and that is when Google Forms becomes incredibly powerful. And we hope that we will be able to, to have an advanced training session on Google Form, or Google Sheets, because an advanced training session on Google Sheets has to include Google Forms. Because what we can do is we can actually create a spreadsheet. We're going to click on this and we're going to say create a new spreadsheet. And it creates the spreadsheet for me. And in this Google Sheet, it adds all of this information. Right? All this information has been added. Who said what? And importantly, the score is added over there. This can be updated as well. So in other words, if I want to, I can um, when when I'm updating it in this instance. So let's just go have a look at the first entry that we had over here that got 13 out of 25. We're going to go to the individual. We'll scroll. I think this is no. Let's go. Uh, let's take response number five. So we're on response number five. I know it's scrolling quite quickly now. This last question we're going to say it is 10 actually, and we're going to say save. Right. So we've saved it. There it is. It's been saved. And if we look at this, the score has also been updated. This is the fifth entry. Now suddenly the person has 18 out of 25. So it'll update the scores on this sheet, um, which becomes very useful. You'll see over there we have an email address, and over here we have a name and a surname. So from this, if you remember some of the, the things that we did in Google Fundamentals 4, you can, for example, calculate the average equals average and it'll give us a suggestion and there we go i know this is getting a little, little bit more tricky and it'll give us the average that we're getting is 10 out of 25. 
And in this way, we can use this information at a later stage. Now, what I want you to do very quickly, I'm going to open up this example form again. Send it. Actually, we have one response. Let's just take the one response. Right. So here's this first form that we built. And what I want you to take note of, especially when you're going to set up quizzes, the multiple choice quizzes that mark themselves, if you're going to set up those quizzes, what I really recommend, make sure that you use the collect email address option so that you can have um, identify who the individuals are that you want to be able to identify. Then when you use the spreadsheet function, if you click on spreadsheet, don't create a new spreadsheet for all of them. Go to select existing spreadsheet, select, and then it's going to show you all your recent spreadsheets that you have. You can also search here at the top if you can't remember what it was. So we're just going to select the Romeo and Juliet, select this one, and now you'll see, once I've copied it into that, and these two have nothing to do with each other in this instance, but what's quite nice is now suddenly I've got my form response one over here. I've got my form response two over here. You can rename these forms to whatever you want. You can add some things to this if you need to, so, so that you can actually use this information. So for a survey, this becomes absolutely vital to be able to use the Google Sheet. Collect information, put it into your survey, and then you've got access to it. For a quiz, it it's just as useful because you actually, all you really want is you want the score and you want the email address or the learner's name so that you can say, at the end of the day, you can easily go and find PT got this mark for this one and for this one and for this one and for this one. And then you can create new sheets and copy and paste these marks uh, to just keep a record of how the learners are progressing. Um, just to show you what you can do with this. So we have reached five o'clock. We have reached the end of the training. Um, so what now? What's the next step that you really need, should take? My suggestion is the first thing that you can do before you do before you do anything else, and it looks like my battery is also going to catch us in a minute or two. Um, the first thing you can do is go and create a survey. I often feel that a survey is, one, is, is an easier thing to do where you just collect the name and the surname and the email address and things like that. Send it to some of your colleagues, let them send the information to you and create a spreadsheet based on that and just see how it works. Um, ask your some of your colleagues to do that. Sh short, simple survey um, where you're just collecting basic information. It's an incredibly useful thing to do in your school, of course, if you need to collect certain things from the teachers to set up a quick form, send it out to them, collect that information, and you've got the information stored um, in a sheet. Secondly, what, what, what I would really suggest you go have a look at is just set up a 10 mark multiple choice, um, multiple choice quiz. Just set up a simple thing and see if you can send it to your learners via WhatsApp or a QR code or however it is that you might be able to use it. Um, and the rest of it, and then revisit this, um, the, the, the video that we've made here from time to time to kind of expand your understanding of what you can do with Google Forms. So with that, I'm going to end off and I'm going to say thank you very much. Um, I know we've gone through a lot of things. Um, we will send you the recording of this so that you can do revision on what we've done. We also hope to make a, a, a number of shorter clips from this training session so that we can use that in, in short 10 minute sessions. How do you do this and how do you do that and how do you do this? and build up um, quite a, a, a different bank because as I'm sure you've seen, there's a lot that you can do with Google Forms once you really start sinking your teeth into it. Um, thank you, Andrea. You had a reasonably quiet um, group to, to work with. Uh, yeah. they, yes, I hope it's not because they're overwhelmed. I hope it's because um, I explained it well enough. I think that might actually be the reason because I learned a bunch of new things now. <laughs> so I really enjoyed it. Right. So I, as I said, I hope this training was, was tr I tried to pitch it um, at 
both the entry level and the more advanced level because there's a lot of cool advanced things you can do, but you don't need to use all of those tricks when you get going with Google Forms. Keep it simple, baby steps, and you'll get there in the end and, um, and, and, and you can do amazing things with Google Forms going forward.